Hello everyone, welcome to this episode of The Circuit, your source for tech and gaming news from around the net. I'm your host, Justin Pack. So, let's start off this week with something only tangentially related to video games. Movies. More specifically, movies based on video games. The motion picture based on a video game in question would be the Uncharted series. If you're not familiar with this series, it's a swashbuckling, shooty, climbing adventure game focusing on rugged main character Nathan Drake. Well, it seems that this much-rumored project is finally going to happen, because Sony Pictures has chosen Sean Levy to direct the film. Originally, I thought that the writer for the Uncharted movie script, Joe Carahan, would be directing the film, but he has since moved his focus to directing the Will Smith Mountain Lawrence reboot of Bad Boys? I guess, hey. What you gonna do? Levy is most known for his work on the Night at the Museum series in Real Steel, and most recently the Netflix original series Stranger Things. I mean, the Uncharted games have a very cinematic presentation, so for all intents and purposes, they're basically just like an Indiana Jones movie that you play through, so it'll be interesting to see if this property transitions from video games to film. There's, I mean, a lot of influences obviously on the games themselves that did come from film, but historically, video game movies are not Great, uh, but it seems like there's a renewed push in Hollywood to cross these mediums with the Assassin's Creed movie coming out soon and there being rumors of a Tomb Raider and Splinter Cell movies also in the works. So I, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, you know, once they come out and the reviews come in, if they're good or not, I don't think it's gonna work. Speaking of video games and reviews, it seems that Bethesda is taking a new approach when it comes to how it deals with sending review copies of their games to media outlets. The company, best known for producing the Fallout series, the Elder Scrolls series, and the Dishonored series, as well as producing some of the most recent Doom and Wolfenstein titles, said in an online press release that they would no longer be sending advanced copies of their video games to reviewers. Instead, reviewers would be getting copies of the games on the same date as the general public. Earlier this year, Bethesda did something similar with the release of Doom, where reviewers received their copies only a day before release. At the time, this led to speculations of the quality of the game might not be so great, but the delayed release schedule did maybe not give people enough time to write the reviews, so if it's a bad game, people aren't going to know before the game's out. And apparently this wasn't the case though, because Doom went on to score pretty well and a lot of review scores, but this did lead some questions about maybe a greater trend in the industry with games and games journalism uh, and just the relationship in between the publishers and the reviewers. Bad reviews can drastically affect video game sales, so from a publisher's point of view, it might be wise to try to mitigate risk of bad review scores by instead relying on marketing to move sales. Bethesda might be doing something similar. Instead of sending review copies of Skyrim Remastered to journalists, they're giving advanced copies to a select few influencers, such as popular game streamers on Twitch and YouTube gaming. Generally, the way this relationship used to work in the past was publishers would send advanced copies to reviewers and video game publications with an embargo date ahead of the actual release title, where no one could publish information until that date. Which, game reviewers then had time to play games and think about it and write their reviews without racing to be the first one out. With Bethesda doing away with this process, it might mean that other publishers will follow suit and this could be a drastic change in the way games media operates. But we'll just have to see if other companies do follow suit or if this is just Bethesda being Bethesda. Well, these possible changes in software review policy make me wonder if there's gonna be some changes in the way hardware is reviewed. For instance, Microsoft, if they send out advanced copies of their new VR headsets they just announced. Yeah, it's only a matter of time, but Microsoft has finally thrown its hat into the VR ring with their new headset. It's getting a little crowded in the VR space. I mean, you've got the Oculus Rift, owned by Facebook, the HTC Vive, which is partnered with Valve and Sony, has the PlayStation VR, those other smaller solutions by, by Samsung and Google, and some other mobile providers, it's like everybody's trying to get on the VR train. This new device was announced by Microsoft at a press event, and it's supposed to work with holographic features built into Windows 10. Also, it's gonna retail at $299, which is quite a bit less expensive than the other major options on the market, which range from $399 from the PlayStation VR to $799 with the HTC Vive. On top of this, Microsoft is boasting something called inside out sensors, which supposedly remove the need for external cameras or laser positioning systems that are used with other headsets on the market. They're also boasting about something called the six degrees of freedom system, which sounds very similar to a technology in the newest version of Oculus Rift. So, uh, 
Not much is known about the system at this point, except it is wholly different from the Microsoft HoloLens technology, a different augmented, not virtual reality, augmented reality tech that is still in development. At this price point, it sounds kind of too good to be true, but my gut says it's not going to be as robust as some of the other experiences offered by more expensive models, but who knows, fingers crossed. This might be a start to making virtual reality headsets even more affordable and accessible to the general public. Like $300 I could probably scrape together, $800 hurts. Oof, that's, ah, well, speaking of another tech company that might be thinking about some money issues, any guesses who it might be? No? It's Apple. Yep, the company's financial reports came out recently and Apple was recording a loss for the first time in 15 years. I mean, 2001, that's a pretty good hot streak, but money's money. So the company's down 7.7% from last year, from $233 billion in 2015 to $215.6 billion in the 2016 fiscal year. What well, this fiscal downturn mainly can be placed on is the fact that iPhone sales have been slowing down for a while now, and that iPhone 7 sales probably won't pick up until the next fiscal year. And it's probably not the only thing affecting how much money they're making, as the company right now is also seeing a downturn of 14% on Macintosh computers. The general feeling in the industry as to why Apple is faulting a bit here financially has a lot to do with the fact that most of their hardware really hasn't changed much in the past few years. Like, the change from an iPhone 3 to an iPhone 4, kind of substantial. iPhone 6 to an iPhone 7, not so much. Uh, it's rumored though that Apple is gearing up for some major hardware changes in 2017 for both their phone and computer lines next year, so it's not all doom and gloom. Apple definitely has some room to turn things around. but that will definitely depend on what they're able to deliver. Because, yeah. Also probably how fast they can get the hype train going. Choo choo. Well, moving on along. If you were maybe hoping to one day Google, get Google Fiber at your home, well, you best not hold your breath. <laughs> Alphabet Inc., the parent company that owns Google, is laying off or reassigning about 9% of its staff and ending and stopping off of fiber operations in 10 different cities where service was not fully up and running. Those cities would include Chicago, Dallas, Tampa, Jacksonville, Florida, Los Angeles, Oklahoma City, Phoenix, Portland, San Diego, San Francisco, San Jose, all the sands. Google has been having some problems with deploying its high-speed internet service in cities across America, not only getting service in like seven locations. It has faced some opposition from other ISPs mainly. For example, there's a recent lawsuit where Comcast has sued the city of Nashville in an attempt to prevent a bill relating to restrictions accessing utility poles. This law would help Google push out Google Fiber, so it seems like there's some background stuff going on there. Yeah, but in the face of all these issues it's been having deploying Google Fiber, Google may be shifting to providing Metro wireless solutions instead, with San Francisco being the first city on the list to get Metro-wide wireless provided by Google. Google Fiber also recently acquired the wireless ISP called WebPass, which uses point-to-point -point wireless communication. Now, that would be a lot less troublesome to deploy because all you need is line of sight to a tower. You don't actually have to lay cables and clogged utility channels. Also, like AT&T and Comcast can't tell you that you can't put a thing on your roof. So, yeah. Well, would you guys pay for Google Internet? I mean, they already have all my data. They might as well provide the service as well. Cut out the middleman. Well, that about does it for this week's show. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll see you guys again next week. Oh my god, this one was hard. I couldn't talk. There's just so many words, and I couldn't say them. Uh, released an online press event, released a press event, released a press event, stating they released a press event, and a press event, and a press event, and a press event. Microphone, why? Microphone, why?